Friends, colleagues and listeners, here we are, 2022. And I've got my old colleague back again, Mr. Dixon. And just want to give you a little bit of news. Now, we thought we'd give it a little bit of a break coming into 2022 because of a lot of travel and a lot of business commitments. And I'm happy to say quite a few people have been in touch saying, what's happened? Is this the end of Morecambe and Wise, the two Ronnies, <laughs> and any other similarities that they could come up with? Well, thank you Sadly so not. much everybody. Yeah, that, no, but really, it was great. You know, sometimes you think, why bother? Or, or you know, is it worthwhile? But, Stephen, I wouldn't say backed by popular demand, but, you know, people have shown an interest and a continued interest, which is fantastic in my book. So, lovely to see you again. Now, what have you been up to? How's the, how's the, first, how's the first month gone for you? Uh, well, uh, first month that um, uh, we've seemed to have crammed probably a month's worth um, um, uh, within within the month um, of mandates probably crammed about three months of work into it, Chris. So I think um, altogether uh, very well indeed. It's been an exceptionally good start to 2022 uh, for for me, our team, and the Skylight Aviation business. Um, uh, we mentioned Skylight Aviation Academy to our listeners before. I think at the um, just to, to tail end of last year that's launched and is now becoming very active uh, uh, in this space. Um, and um, and our clients are also seeing um, seeing some you know positive uplift in travel, um, you know good forward bookings, um, uh, you know airports starting to resemble airports and airspace I should say starting to resemble something of of um, what what could be the the, um, the sort of the um, the last few steps on this road to to normalcy and. Uh, and recovery so um you know pre-2019 numbers for for um uh lots of people are starting to look uh, look pretty good and you know getting back up there 80 80 90 percent of 2019 that said some parts of the world including where i am now currently in malaysia still um, still very sluggish here in in asia but a little bit slower although uh, we'll talk a little bit of that i guess um i guess further down the track but yes no look it's good to be back chris um and uh i can't say that um, that we haven't um <laughs> We haven't been in discussion uh, since the last podcast because I speak to you every day. So um, I know you've just come back from holiday yourself, but um, I'm, and I'm sure looking forward to getting stuck back in. Although you never, you never, you never actually took that break. I'm not sure. Did did did, did Kathy um, was Kathy complimentary about how much time you gave her on, on holiday, Chris? We won't go there, Stephen. But um, you know, I I, um, I owe a lot. I owe a lot now back. But uh, no, but it was lovely. And and uh, you know, whilst we're talking about travel. I managed to get down to South Africa. Fantastic, absolutely. To, you know, yeah. to be able to travel again, and and uh, but also it's it's, it's eye opening to see how different different countries are are handling things, and um, you know everywhere we went, you know masks couldn't come in anywhere without masks. You had to sanitise before you went into every every shop, every restaurant, every bar. You know they were really strongly disciplined. It was it, it was good to see, and as a result, they've got an awful lot of freedom over there. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, the same level of discipline we're seeing in lots of places. I think, um, you know, even even during during the Christmas um, travel, I mean, my family, uh, including the in-laws, were all over in the UK and they were quite surprised at the levels of compliance now that people were seeing. I know they've sort of unripped the mask rule now, which is very good, very good in terms of getting back to normalcy, but, um, but also the same happening in Scandinavia and people actually getting rid of masks completely, which is really good and really, really, um, really helps us. Um, you know, lose, lose these bastions of COVID because actually if you don't remove these batteries at some stage, they will stay for good. And no airline yet, Chris, if you've noticed, has has removed masks as a requirement, although they're no longer, they're no longer um, uh, enforceable by law. But, um, but I haven't seen an airline yet that's taken that bold move to remove masks <laughs> completely. But you know something, Steve, and, and like you, you've spent a lot of time in the Far East as well. And, you know, I, I've, I've always been used to that. And I've always been used to the fact that, you know, they wear the masks to protect others, not themselves. And I, I just I don't see anything wrong with the uh, with the mask discipline on the aircraft. Not not at the moment. Anyhow, and, and and especially not when you've got to go from terminal to stand because some of the buses are getting packed in so, so crammed because they don't have enough enough staff to do the driving. And um, so for me, anyhow, I know we differ on a few things, which is what. That's one of our relationships so healthy, Stephen. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Indeed. So listen, on the travel topic, I just want to put a little shout out there. Sure. Um, we've got the EVA, the EVA conference now is confirmed, and it's uh, it's going to happen between the 5th and the 7th of September in Athens. 
So it's really, really good now to see that coming up again because it's been a couple of years. It's been put back and put back. So really looking forward to seeing a lot of people um, at the one in in, uh, in September. And, Stephen, I, I know you'll appreciate this. Um, we, we were uh, we were discussing, you know, what the content was going to be, and, and it's with Des Fatanis and Stan Rafe. And, um, you know, going to really, really, really try and be a little bit edgy now at this one and, and you know, really hit some points and make sure that... Um, you know, sensitive issues are being addressed, uh, but addressed positively, but also, you know, with a with with one eye, one eye focusing on what should be done now urgently, and another what's going to happen in the future if things aren't done urgently. So yeah. it's going to be a great great conference. I hope I hope lots of people uh, sign up for it. Now back to you and me, sir. So one of the things I want to talk to you about today. OK, is cyber security. So, you know, everybody's been seeing in the papers, you know, what would or wouldn't happen with the Russian Ukrainian issue and, 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 and how repercussions can be can be dealt out through hackers and God knows what. But there's been a lot of news and I think there's going to be a lot of news popping up over the next week or so about organisation companies across many industries that have already been hacked over this last week or so. Uh, now, this in itself, Steve, is a, is is almost like a pandemic if it goes crazy. Yeah, look, I think um, Chris, it's a it's an area of the business that's been getting for the right reasons, you know, more and more attention in the last um, the last few years. Um, you know, we've seen we've seen widespread, um, or sorry, I should say, wide scale sort of you know uh, uh, um, uh, you know events that have you know taken out um, airlines completely um, or acquired um, you know customer data, um, uh, payment uh, payment um, uh, you know credit cards and so on. And um, um, but I think those are you know I think those are those sort of big events, Chris, that are sort of you know headline news. They they, they get a lot of of attention. I think it's the smaller stuff that, that probably we need to be a little bit more focused on. The sort of these continual attacks or threats yeah. that are that exist there. Whether it's um, you know, I was just booking some flights. I'm traveling again next week. In fact, I'm traveling at almost full time for the next the next six weeks. I just looked at my diary today. It's pretty incredible how this has turned turned uh, you know turned the corner pretty pretty swiftly this this early part of the year. But um, I was booking some flights, and one of the options that I was given did I want to save my payment card. Um, you know, to their um, to their portal, and I said no, thank you oh, very much. Yeah. Um, and um, I think it's I think it's sort of stuff like that that um, that actually it's about sort of you know uh, resetting the baseline and what is what is acceptable. So I know that you know obviously there's there are very clear clear rules around you know PCI compliance and payment methodology. Actually, that's probably right up there with some of the most um, let's call it um, you know well defined or well sort of governed areas of of data protection. Um, um, but all of that other personal data, Chris, you think about how much data you're now exchanging, um, you know, uh, between airlines, airports, current handlers, um, health authorities, um, you know, intermediate third parties, laboratories, PCR tests and providers, yada, yada, yada. I mean, the list now is endless. Um, I wouldn't quite say travel is is um, is. <laughs> It's as easy as it was before, but I'm now doing a lot of it, which is great. But that means I'm very well practiced at what's required uh, in most uh, most places that I'm visiting now. But one thing I do find is there's an inordinate amount of data, personal data that's personal to me, that is being shared, um, and some of it on in paper form. I was in uh, I was in Portugal last week, um, and um, I had to fill in a a, a manual. Uh, form for um, for my PCR uh, test, which um, included things, all sorts of things, but my my health record. Now, per personally, um, uh, you know, I, I I I don't think that is of much value to somebody in the European sense. But provision of health record data in markets like North America, yeah, where people yeah. trade on this, and really sort of you know, uh, really it really becomes really. Um, you know, sort of a, a a commodity trade, if you like, and and people are, are uh, pardon the pardon the phraseology, but sort of shit scared of their records being leaked because yep. they know that the health insurance providers will capitalise on that and ratchet up their premiums if there's something that they've not declared or that's on their GP or their medical record that was never there. So I'm a bit cautious about things like that, not because I've got anything to hide, um, but only because, and again, for me personally, no issue uh, in the European setting. No no problem, but I think we've got to be more cognizant as an industry 
of what data is being shared, whom we're sharing it with, why are we sharing it with private sector providers? Because all of that data that now sits in some repository or whether it's on-prem facilities, um, uh, you know, on-prem storage, off-prem storage, cloud, edge, whatever. I mean, all these sort of fancy things that I know not much about enough to enough to um, to realize that I've got to employ somebody to um, to do those client jobs for us. But um, but in that sort of sense, what we what we what we find is really lots of holes. Lots of aspects that may be porous and could well be targeted. So that I think is an aspect, Chris, in terms of the of the, you know, in the last two years, something that has changed markedly from what we had before, which was really just a transaction between airline and passenger. Okay, Grand Handler as a as a as a related party to that, and government authority at the other end, whether it be for API or PNR Gov or Exchange. It, it, it's a much bigger system now, Chris. And I think that's where some of the risks may well exist, particularly in these sort of fly-by-night operators in labs and the like that have access to your passport data because it's required by the airline or the government, the arrival authority to retain your passport data. It has your date of birth. It has all sorts of other stuff on there. It probably has your itinerary, where you're flying to from. And one would ask, why would a private sector laboratory need all that information to do their job? What you need it to come out of it is a, is a, is a, is a result that says positive or negative and, and be off with it. Or in fact, no more tests at all, which I'm a complete advocate of. <laughs> Um, yeah, because yeah. testing now is a complete and utter waste of everybody's time, money, and effort. No more tests, please. Uh, let's get back to normality. Let's use the vaccines as the way out of this, uh, as people in in the advanced and mature countries are doing. So yeah. I think that would uh, that would help a lot. Anyway, yeah, for my idea. monologue, I will now I will now probably end there. <laughs> right, good, good lad. But listen, something that you brought up there about the the personal. Um, fears again now and and you know questions as to why so much information and then that that actually trickles down onto the onto the business side of it because one of the things that we want to do um within with especially within cargo is be more open and sharing of data um so that people can actually use it for the benefit of you know enhancing and doing more with less and efficiencies etc and whilst you've got this sort of gap and people aren't sure and even some very very good companies steve the reliance on their IT departments and what their IT departments are capable of doing is nowhere near what should be done to protect so much information. So there's a big, big issue. And um, I'm glad to say we're also doing a, a little mini series with Matthew Vaughan from IATA. And we're covering you know, basic safety and security considerations uh, for, for logistics uh, from a broader international overview. We're also covering the internet of safety and security we're covering um, screening changes. We're covering security as a commercial asset, human factors in security and safety, and also supporting air cargo logistics and national vision. So we're doing like a six series exercise with him and that's starting next week. So I'm, I'm hoping some good stuff will come out of that. And it's just to make people more aware and, you know, have a little reflection on whether or not they've assessed their risk well enough and that they've got the capability because there's a lot of incredibly good organizations out there who are able to help indeed i agree yeah now another thing another thing that you you've been talking about for a long time and and, and it's interesting because it popped up it popped up yesterday because i've got a lot of family coming over from ireland and um for, for there's a rugby for, match uh, there's a rugby match today chris so i think i uh, remember yeah 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 so uh, we, there's a memorial game for for, for my brother today um against london irish so um uh, yeah. okay got a lot of family over but a lot of them were commenting on problems that they've had you know with getting refunds and um and then there was a little snippet of news about Ryanair being voted the worst short haul airline for covid refunds um whereby it was given a refund rating of only 47% in the survey from the uh, which... I think they should they should talk to Air Asia which is probably about 10% could you <laughs> consumer group but but i remember you saying this right at the very beginning that customers will and should gonna, remember oh, how they were treated oh, i've got a power power cable issue stand by one all right i will um i'll be back and just like that we are reconnected and we're in business sorry hey. Chris. yeah I, I think the phrase i used at the time was um one lives by the sword and 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 dies by the sword. Um, yeah. You know, and um, you know, it, it, it's 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 airlines. Uh, well, actually, not just airline, but it's any businesses, 
behavior and response to customers um, you know, during this pandemic that will be remembered for either the right reasons or the wrong reasons. Um, and it's very simple. I mean, I, you know, people will vote with their feet. Um, we've seen actually that um, that despite, you know, whatever claims Ryanair may have, Ryanair are, are the airline in Europe that has recovered uh, to um, to actually greater than 2019 in 2019, 2019, put my teeth back in, 2019 <laughs> capacity. So it's not having much effect. So there might be a little bit of rhetoric there, Chris. Um, uh, I saw, you know, I mean, there's there, there, there actually some of the major carriers, the, 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 it's the full service carriers, or dare I say, these sort of the, what, what they want to tell themselves is not full service, but premium. Um, but premium yeah. is a relative yeah. term. And therefore, it's, as an adjective, it can be used to describe, describe one's relative to others. And um, so British Air was on a premium march this week. And one of the things that um, that their CEO, Sean Doyle, sent an email to all of their their um, their loyal um, gold, gold guest list and and premier um, uh, customers uh, was that um, we're really, you know, going to turn up the dial on customer service. We recognize we've failed. We recognize that we've let you down. We recognize that wait times have been exceptionally long. We recognize these, these, these are issues for our customers and we're going to solve them. The first thing that said to me was it disarmed me immediately. Now, I did not have a gripe with British Airways because actually during the pandemic, I continue to fly British Airways. I've got three grand sitting in an account with them that I said, just leave there, park it. I'll, you know, I'll use it when, when I need it. They, they, they honored that and they did that. Um, and I've continued to fly with them. So I haven't had a gripe with them, but I know many people have. And, um, and it's caused a real sort of um, sense of animosity from a lot of their loyal customers. So yeah. it's one thing, Chris, people flying once a year on Ryanair who might whinge about their refund. It's something else completely different when people fly four or five, six times a year British Airways in premium cabins um, and they've got a gripe. That really will hit the bottom bottom line and the, um, and, and the pocket of British Airways. So I'm not I'm not excusing that, I'm saying, I'm saying but it's one, it, the first thing is that they put their hand up and say, we've got a problem. So um, uh, uh, the second thing is, uh, I guess what they've now got to do is they will be, they'll be measured whether it's Ryanair or, or um, British Airways, or EasyJet, Air Asia, disaster in, 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 in Asia, um, you know, recapitalization of the business, shareholders, you know, uh, uh, talking about all their own sort of um, uh, gains and benefits and establishment of new businesses. Meantime, um, hardly 90, 95% of the customers has got bugger all, um, an outrageous uh, uh, slur uh, here locally. So we won't be flying on Air Asia. Um, and it's sad, saddened me to say that because, of course, I spent a number of years since 2007 and eight working for and with Air Asia. Um, so, you know, where there's, where there are small markets, people can vote with their feet and they can use others and they will, I suppose, recover, recover the quickest. Um, but, um, hey, look, uh, uh, I think let's hope, Chris, now that the obviously the capital flight or the capital issues tightening of cash position has not helped. You know, investors, you know, uh, I mean, Buffett was sort of first out the door, you know, um, let's get out of this game. This is the mugs game being in the airline business. Um, but, you know, so that's not helped them. Recapitalization, government's taking stakes, um, yeah, yeah. you know, all of that's not helped. But now, now is the time to change and fix that. At the time also that we need to look also to the employee, Chris, how are these companies dealing and looking after their employees? How are they... You know? 100% agree. And, and, and so it's not just the customer. I think there's a balance. Um, yeah. You know, when you see CEOs posting pictures of new Teslas online or they're, they're in, their, in their fancy Hermes, um, you know, tie and belt com combo, um, and yet they haven't paid their, haven't paid their staff or the, um, you know, they're still, their staff are still on, you know, 20 or 30% of base pay. I think that's, that's pretty sinful and does not get the measure of um, of how staff have been affected and impacted by by the pandemic and by their actions, and and I think Steve, this is going to be a tsunami, you know, the people issues because you've got you've got so many issues which I agree with you where you know people they took a big hit when things were bad, and now they're using their strength of of shall we say a shortage of experience, a shortage of numbers, and not having the right people in the right positions, etc. <clears throat> Excuse me, and they're using that strength now to come back because look at all of the um potential strikes now 
that are facing us now moving you know moving forward and and people now asking for huge increases and you know people are now giving eight and nine percent increases there's huge signing on fees and and this people issue now has got to be addressed from from many areas so it can't just be now right you know we haven't been dealt correctly so now we're gonna we're gonna use our strength to get what we want that that's not totally right but it has to be addressed then you've got the shortage of skills then you've got the shortage of of training to keep people at the level that's necessary and then you've got the lack of awareness and understanding that if you're an employee you need your company to be successful so that you've got some security and you've got a career ahead of you so how how agile should the individual become should they now start to look at ways to enhance their own their own um, skills base to it to 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 make remuneration um, projects or programs different and innovative so people can be paid for what they produce there's so many so many different things now they're going to come have to come into this particular area you know for people to be successful and to feel that they're working for a good carrier or a good company and that that company cares about them as well and then on top of that you've got all the pressures of having to be seen to be green yeah yeah absolutely i totally agree i mean i think this i mean uh, the 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 resource issues are real chris as you say and they're, they're not going to go away anytime soon um uh, the levels of attrition that are being seen in business now. I mean, sort of... It's, madness. It's just madness. Mad, absolute madness. But Chris, a lot of this would have been predictable. I, I was having a conversation um, um, with a client in Canada yesterday, and um, it's a large international organisation um, and um, a representative body who, who a lot of their members are sort of saying, look, a lot of this could have been could have been predicted. Some of this could have been well known in 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 advance. Now, I'm not saying that. So the intricate details would have been understood in terms of you know how it moves sort of a micro between market to market or what the drivers were. But at a macro level, Chris, we understood that employment was tight. We understood that people would yeah. go off elsewhere. We knew this. Dare I say? In probably to be fair, let me be very kind. Probably third quarter, fourth quarter, 20, um, 2021. Um, as we came back into 2020, sorry, 2020, as we came back into 2021, you know, um, so, you know, travel dipped again and capacity dipped quite off, actually off, didn't dip, it fell off a cliff um, uh, as we went into the, you know, first quarter of 2021. Um, uh, and that's when there were more, more redundancies, more retrenchments, you know, more furlough. Um, and that's when, when employees when you've got bills to pay, Chris, and you've got mouths to feed, and you've got dinner to put on the table and pay your mortgage at the end of the day, they're not going to sit and wait for, you know, whether it's Swissport or it's Donata or it's um, or it's Heathrow Airport Limited or it's British Airways or it's American Airlines. They, they're not going to wait for that phone call. They, they frankly don't give us stuff. What they're doing now, and we're seeing evidence of this in Europe, is they're moving for two, two or three um, um, yeah. you know, percent yeah. difference in um, in compensation. Yeah. So. We saw this early on. Now, what could have been done differently? I guess is the is the is the is sort of the question. And um, I suspect there was an element of the conversation needing to be had between the service providers and the client airlines or the client forwarders or the client airports or whomever around you know cost of service delivery. Um, instead, what we did was we all went into this, you know, with our probably head in the sand, and I'm as culpable and guilty as, as everybody else, but with our head in the sand, um, thinking it will come good, we'll come good, people will come back, they'll come back, they'll come back. Well, guess what? They didn't come back. We've now come unstuck. We're now seeing pay deals that are, you know, astronomical in relative terms to where, what the pay deals that were previously done, Chris. Are the pay deals fair or right? Well, I, I will defer judgment on that because I think that's probably improper of me to do so. Um, um, uh, you know, given different market dynamics and different issues and legacy pay and so on, so I think that's probably unfair. But 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 there is an element of, I think we saw this coming. We did. We the industry did nothing about it, and as a result, we're now going to go into summer 2022 when epidemiologically the world and the globe is at a much better place in terms of the COVID response than it has ever been. And we're going to be able now, we're not going to be able now to serve the same customer airlines, the same customers that want to travel, who couldn't travel maybe for the last two years, either because of risk or, you know, health issues or because they um, you know, physically couldn't because of 
restrictions. And remember, there's, there are still countries like that bloody, um, uh, one of the, uh, you know, I wouldn't say the penal colony because that's Australia, but the hermit kingdom of New Zealand um, that still lock out their own people. And one of the yeah. pregnant journalists had to be taken in by the Taliban of all people in, uh, in Kabul. I mean, just unbelievable. Malaysia's border is still closed um, to most people. So there are still countries where people that have been you know, separated, relatives, family, friends, for two yeah, years, Chris. Yeah. So now they want to travel. There'll be no airport staff, security staff, ground handling staff, staff to move your e-commerce stuff around in a warehouse. That will all now be really helped unless industry comes together quickly and conversations happen uh, around you know price of delivering a service now yes. here, it puts the trade unions in a very strong position chris too um, strong too so strong in my mind way too strong um but look uh, the employers thought they could ride roughshod over the employees for just a little bit too long i would say and expecting them to do their dirty work and yeah when when it's all, when the shit hits a fan there's the door fred um but when the um, but when the going comes good and we've committed to service all these airlines for summer 2022 oh fred are you available no i'm earning 75 grand as a truck driver for waitrose yeah and i think i think steve i think what what you just touched base on there is it, it's all very true, but we've got to be so, so careful now because this this extremes, you know, going up, going down is not good for anything. And I think one of the things that people didn't do, and, and I'm getting an awful lot of um, of um, interest on this, is they, they didn't actually work out what the worst case scenarios were. Not, not, not panicking and not being a doom monger, but just working out what the worst case scenarios were and putting something in motion to make sure that it didn't hit those those levels. And now I think, you know, there's got to be a lot more transparency. You've spoken about this before, whereby organisations share a lot more of their success and have maybe even milestones or parameters that when it hits a certain level, their employees should should share in those benefits. And um, but it's going to be it's going to be a very, very tough, tough year this year because of the people issue, Stephen. Mm -hmm. And I think we should leave it there because we could the pair of us go on talking about that for a long time. I know Sarland wants to keep the shows a little bit shorter. So I think that gives us plenty of opportunity to open up again. And we should do because this people issue is going to be so, so important um, across the industry. So I think without further ado, great to be back, Steve. Always a pleasure to see you. Glad you're doing so well. Glad you're racking up the miles. And um, if you need somebody to come with you now that you've got that fund in the BA, in the BA bank, I'm happy to join you on any trip. <laughs> Uh, well, Chris, uh, as you well know from our conversations yesterday, that might be sooner rather than later. And Definitely. I will I will look forward to it, especially to a Hakushu or Hebiki at the end of the night, <laughs> given that we didn't manage to have one at Christmas. Um, uh, uh, I owe you that privilege, if yeah, nothing else. Um, yeah, but, and I'll tell you, after, after, after being on the wrong end of that bill, I'm going to make, make good use of it, my friend. <laughs> Yeah, no, take care, Steve. Lovely to, lovely to see you back and uh, and continued success, mate. I think it's going to be a great year for you. Thanks very much, Chris. Likewise, I shall speak to you next week from a different location.